In September of 1999, a man was admitted to a hospital in the Ibaraki prefecture suffering from intense vomiting and a sense of overwhelming fatigue. Hisashi Ouchi looked very off. His face and eyes were red, and he complained about pain beneath his right ear and in his right arm. The doctors were totally baffled, but his lab results were even weirder. In a healthy human, lymphocytes test around 25 to 48 percent, but in Hisashi's blood, the doctors only found 2 percent. This signaled that his immune system was on the brink of shutting down. The medics were shocked that a patient with such stats was even still alive. As it turned out, he worked at a facility that processed nuclear fuel. Sure enough, Hisashi displayed classic symptoms of radiation sickness, so the doctors initiated a standard procedure. But they had no clue what radiation was going to do to their patient's body. In this video, brace yourselves for some of the most hair-raising cases of radiation exposure. What should you never touch in an abandoned hospital? Why did scientists keep messing with a killer core? Which horrifying nuclear incident in the ocean did the Soviets try to conceal? And most importantly, what does intense radiation really do to the human body? The most terrible thing is that radiation victims often don't even know they've been exposed or how severe their dosage is. Hisashi Ouchi was transferred to Tokyo University's hospital. There, a special double room awaited him, designed to completely isolate the patient from the outside world. The medics knew his chances of survival hinged primarily on maintaining a sterile environment. Radiation sickness evolves in stages, and the early ones are pretty well studied. In the first phase, the body tries to expel the radiation as quickly as possible. Hence, symptoms like vomiting and diarrhea arise as a reaction to the irritation of mucous membranes. The good news is that this phase only lasts a few hours, after which symptoms fade. Then the second latent period begins. Its trickiness lies in the fact that all disease manifestations vanish, but not the radiation. The patient feels better, but during this time, radiation is actively destroying their body, as the aftermath is bound to reveal. Hisashi was lucky to have been taken to the hospital, where the staff knew for sure what to do, or so they thought. Because at that moment, no one truly knew the radiation dose Hisashi had been hit with. But back then, nobody worried about such details. At the dawn of the 20th century, radium wasn't considered dangerous. In fact, doctors claimed this chemical element was good for health. The United States Radium Corporation began producing a luminescent paint based on radium. In 1917, with the U.S. joining the First World War, the mass production of clocks with radium backlighting started. The details had to be hand-painted, so over 4,000 young women received a dream job. The task was simple, hand paint 250 clocks per day using a tiny camel hair brush. But there was a catch. They had to lick the brush every few strokes to prevent the silvery paint from drying. For kicks, some girls would even paint their nails, lips, and teeth with the stuff to go dancing. But after a few years on the job, factory workers started complaining of fatigue, anemia, bleeding gums, jaw pain, miscarriages, fractures, and even cancer. The first to suffer was 24-year-old Molly Magia. She went to see a dentist because of a toothache. But when the dentist tried to extract the tooth, her jawbone literally came off and remained in his hands. Her wound never healed, and Molly's condition rapidly declined. Within a few years, as her bones essentially crumbled, Molly passed away. There were dozens of similar cases. Observing these workers' final years, 
doctors began to finally understand what happens to the human body under the influence of radiation. Today, radioactive materials aren't even used in medicine, but occasionally still with unforeseen deadly outcomes, all because of ignorance. In 1987, in Goyonia, a pair of scrap metal dealers broke into an abandoned hospital hunting for treasures. Soon, they stumbled upon a medical machine. Inside it was a surprise, a lead steel canister containing a capsule. They took it, unwittingly setting off a countdown to disaster. Five days later, the dealer sold the canister to a junkyard. Its owner, Devair Fejera, instructed it to be cut open. Inside the capsule was a powder that glowed with a blue luminescence. Fejera brought the powder home and invited people to his house for the next two weeks. People came by, marveled at the shimmering powder, touched it, rubbed it into their skin for fun, and even took samples home. Fejera's six-year-old niece, Leda Das Neves, received the magical powder as a gift from her father. But the games had to be stopped quickly. The girl was rushed to the hospital, where it was discovered that the magical powder was actually radioactive cesium-137 chloride. All this time, it had been silently killing everyone it came into contact with. The girl rapidly developed severe swelling in the upper part of her body, and her hair fell out. She was isolated in a separate room, but her condition deteriorated quickly. First, her kidneys and lungs failed, followed by internal bleeding, which led to her death just a month later. She was buried in a fiberglass coffin to prevent radiation from spreading. In the following days, similar symptoms claimed the lives of three others. The junkyard owner's wife and two young men, aged 22 and 18, who helped cut the capsule open. But the aftermath of this fatal discovery didn't end there. Around 200 people were admitted to the hospital and had to undergo treatment for over 20 years. Fejera himself passed away in 1994, weighed down by guilt that he tried to drown in alcohol. This tragedy could have been avoided if the hospital staff had properly disposed of the capsule. And it's not the only case of radiation disasters that occurred owing to negligence. In fact, Hisashi Ouchi, who worked as a technician at the Tokaimura Nuclear Fuel Processing Plant, became a victim due to workplace negligence. The plant functioned as a transfer point, producing fuel rods for nuclear reactors. To do this, radioactive uranium was stabilized in tall, thin cylinders mixed with nitric acid and then transferred to a storage tank. However, later, they decided to simplify the process, mixing the uranium with nitric acid in a regular old bucket, from which they would then pour it into the stabilization tank. This saved time and energy because they didn't have to start up the heavy machinery and wait. On the day of the disaster, Hisashi's boss asked for his assistance. Since he'd never done this job before, he was unaware that for safety reasons, storing uranium required specific tall and thin cylinders, not the ones they were using that day. Moreover, to expedite the process, they upped the uranium concentration in the cylinder from 5 to 18 percent. Therefore, when the final bucket of solution was poured into the tank, the room was bathed in a blue glow. This phenomenon occurs when nuclear materials reach criticality. It's a state where the atoms are so close together that neutrons strike and replace one another within those atoms. In essence, Hisashi had activated a nuclear reactor right there in the middle of the room. 
The safe dose for humans is one thousandth of a sievert, but it was clear that the plant workers received much, much more. Nonetheless, nobody knew just how much Hisashi had absorbed. The incident caused panic, leading to an evacuation within several hundred meters of the site. But when an even more severe accident occurred in Russia, the information was, conversely, suppressed. On May 26, 1971, the outskirts of Moscow faced the threat of a radioactive cloud. The Kurchatov Institute housed an experimental reactor. At the end of the workday, employees deactivated it, which takes time and caution. But on that particular evening, everyone was so eager to finish work sooner, they decided to follow an emergency shutdown protocol. As a result, the entire structure didn't have time to cool down and became extremely hot. At the base of the reactor, excessive pressure formed, causing the uranium rods to become unseated and fall out. They landed a level below and formed a critical mass. A radiation flash occurred, after which the rods melted, halting the nuclear reaction. But it was too late. Within the brief moments the reaction lasted, technician Vasilyev received a radiation dose of six sieverts and died of a heart attack the next day. His colleague received two sieverts and fought for his life for another two weeks until he eventually succumbed to radiation sickness. Other workers were shielded from the radiation by the concrete structure. However, one of them eventually had to have his legs amputated due to radiation exposure. The incident was kept secret, even from the Kurchatov Institute employees from other departments. As for the radioactive cloud formed by the accident, it supposedly never extended beyond the Institute's grounds. During the Soviet era, at least five similar incidents were kept under wraps. But on the other side of the world, something similar was unfolding. July 24, 1964 became the worst day for Robert Peabody, a production operator at the Wood River Junction Nuclear Facility in Rhode Island, where they processed fuel rods for nuclear reactors and other manufacturing byproducts. An accident occurred on the production line, necessitating its immediate disassembly. As a result, the room was littered with containers filled with radioactive items and substances. Substances, specifically, special 11-liter bottles containing a solution of uranium in both low and high concentrations marked with paper labels held by rubber bands. Despite the accident, the solvent that had accumulated uranium after washing radioactive parts had to be purified. To do this, it was enough to just add a special reagent and shake manually. But this time, because of the accident, the workers decided to save time and purify the solvent in large batches using a vat with a mixer. This was supposed to be entirely safe as long as the uranium concentration remained low. Peabody took a bottle filled with a bright yellow liquid and carried it to the vat. The label had fallen off the bottle because the rubber band had snapped, and he was unaware that the bottle actually contained uranium of a very high concentration. Before Peabody even finished pouring all the liquid, he realized something terrible had happened. Sirens echoed throughout the building. A flash of blue light burst from the vat, and splashes of the hot liquid reached as high as the 20-meter tall ceiling. This was because the vat had turned into an uncontrollable nuclear reactor. Peabody rushed out of the room, tearing off his contaminated clothes, but it was already too late. He began to vomit, and blood was streaming from his nose and ears. Within an hour, Peabody was in the hospital, and it seemed he was getting better. 
However, swelling soon appeared, and they had to cut his wedding ring from his finger. His blood pressure plummeted. Peabody slipped into a coma and died 49 hours after the incident. Given he was exposed to a radiation dose of 100 sieverts, it's surprising he lasted that long. That's a thousand times more than the lethal dose. During the factory accident in Japan, Hisashi Ouchi received a much lower dose than Peabody, but at the same time, much more than the Kirchitov Institute employees who died. Essentially, this was a unique radiation experiment on a human being. Hisashi Ouchi was the first human to receive a massive radiation dose of 20 sieverts and continue living. As a result, to try and save him, the medics had to resort to experimental treatment. During the third phase of radiation sickness, the damage accumulates and the patient's condition deteriorates significantly. The consequences can range from mild symptoms like skin burns or mucosal damage to a complete immune system shutdown, which happened to Hisashi. His first major issue was breathing. Due to severe chest pain, Hisashi could only take shallow breaths. As such, he was hooked up to a machine that breathed for him. The doctors took a bone marrow sample from Hisashi to determine the extent of damage to his immune system. However, it turned out it wasn't just damaged, but almost completely erased at the genetic level. The doctors considered a transplant, but the tests indicated it would be impossible. Hisashi's blood just had too few lymphocytes to fight infections after the surgery. Moreover, he was deficient in platelets. Any small cut could lead to him bleeding out. So they took stem cells from one of Hisashi's sisters and administered them intravenously. The first experimental transfusion took four hours, and immediately after the procedure, the patient's condition deteriorated sharply. His mucous membranes were destroyed, causing rapid dehydration. A week after the exposure, when replacing a catheter, a nurse removed an adhesive plaster and inadvertently took off a chunk of skin with it. New cells weren't regenerating, and the old ones had died. Hisashi was now wrapped in his own skin like a suit that could be easily removed. But the worst part was that because of circulatory issues, painkillers didn't work. Due to the unbearable pain, Hisashi would push nurses away and scream that he wasn't a guinea pig. But while the doctor's experiments aimed at saving the patient, other experiments ended up killing hundreds. In the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico, scientists worked on creating the deadliest weapon ever, nuclear bombs. Even after the nuclear program was disbanded, one such bomb's core was kept there for research. It became known as the Demon Core, and here's why. In 1945, a young, talented scientist, Harry Daglian, took up working on creating a neutron reflector. To study the core's criticality, he surrounded the 6-pound plutonium core with 10-pound tungsten carbide bricks. Each brick brought the core closer to criticality, so Daglian carefully monitored the neutron counter to ensure he didn't place too many. As Daglian approached with the final brick, the counter signaled an impending supercritical state. He tried to retract his hand from the core, but lost his grip. The brick fell, causing a catastrophe. A wave of heat and a blue glow filled the room. To halt the reaction, Daglian dismantled the setup with his bare hands. He was immediately rushed to the hospital. Having been exposed to a radiation dose of 21 sieverts, he quickly fell into a coma and 25 days after the incident died from severe radiation sickness effects. His immune system just couldn't cope. 
A modern analysis suggests that Daglian was killed by the radiation received while disassembling the setup. However, the demon core continued its lethal legacy. Daglian's colleague in researching the criticality of uranium and plutonium was Louis Sloten. Due to his stubborn character, he undertook a very similar experiment in 1946, despite being fully aware of its dangers. In Sloten's case, the demon core was positioned between beryllium half-spheres. The key condition was to leave a space between them for excess neutrons to escape. And Sloten did this using a screwdriver which he held in his hand. The experiment ended when the screwdriver slipped out of his grip. The hemispheres joined, and a chain reaction with a radiation burst occurred. A blue ionizing glow and heat wave filled the room. He removed the top hemisphere within seconds, but it was too late. Sloten tasted sourness in his mouth, and a burning sensation developed in his left hand. According to a modern analysis, his radiation exposure was over 21 sieverts. The researcher felt nauseated throughout the next day. By the second day in the hospital, his conditions seemed to improve, but on the third, the effects of the radiation were apparent. His hands became swollen and turned blue and he developed erythema. His intestines and bladder failed. The doctors described Sloten's condition as a three-dimensional sunburn. Sloten fell into a coma and died on the 10th day after the incident in the same room as Douglian. This incident marked the end of hands-on reflector experiments and the demon core was eventually destroyed. But the most terrifying incidents don't occur due to the audacity of the experimenters, but due to unpredictable accidents. The incident at the plant where Hisashi Ouchi worked was classified as an accident because over 600 people were affected. However, all of them received minimal radiation and did not fall ill. Meanwhile, Hisashi was in the fourth stage of radiation sickness progression. This stage is decisive. A person either fully recovers or dies. Ten days after the factory accident, Hisashi Ouchi was connected to a breathing tube and could no longer speak. After the stem cell transfusion, there was hope that Hisashi would recover. But when the doctors took new bone marrow cell samples, they were unpleasantly surprised. About 10% of the cells transfused to Hisashi from his sister had damaged chromosomes. The doctors didn't have time to figure things out because Hisashi started bleeding in the intestine. The doctors risked performing an endoscopy and saw that there was no mucous membrane. Despite the deadly manifestations of the fourth stage of radiation sickness, Hisashi continued to fight for his life, so the doctors didn't lose hope. But what would happen if many people were exposed to such a hefty radiation dose at once? K-19 was the first Soviet submarine armed with nuclear warheads. In June of 1961, the vessel participated in exercises in the Arctic Ocean. But then, something that no one expected happened. The sole cooling pipe of the reactor simply cracked, unable to withstand the pressure of 200 atmospheres. Water from the cooler poured into the reactor compartment and then throughout the submarine. Molten uranium accumulated in the reactor tray, exceeding the critical mass. An atomic explosion was imminent. It would have been a precursor to Chernobyl because the ship had another reactor in three nuclear warheads. Someone had to go inside, risking their life to fix the reactor's cooling system. The captain sent Lieutenant Korchilov first. The only protection available were gas masks and raincoats, which obviously didn't shield against radiation. After five minutes, Korchilov ran out of the reactor compartment, tore off his gas mask, 
started to vomit. The area of his skin not protected by clothing quickly turned red. His face and hands swelled, and blood seeped from under his hair. Korchilov received 54 sieverts of radiation. 22 people died on K-19 due to radiation exposure. Everything the sailors came into contact with in the hospital had to be destroyed. They were buried in a mass grave, and the accident was kept a strict secret until the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And Lieutenant Korchilov was not the only one who gave his life to prevent the spread of the disaster. Alexander Lelichenko worked as the deputy head of the electrical department at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. His colleagues thought of him as an excellent specialist, but lacking grit. However, on April 26, 1986, he proved otherwise. It's hard to imagine, but the Chernobyl disaster could have been several times worse. After the initial explosion, the fire was spreading rapidly, and a new series of explosions could have occurred. Lelichenko was called to the station within minutes of the accident. He was tasked with disconnecting the hydrogen unit of the fourth power reactor to prevent a hydrogen explosion. Lelichenko rushed to shut off the hydrogen supply to the malfunctioning generator. He knew he had received an extremely high radiation dose, close to 25 sieverts. Despite feeling weak and nauseated, he continued disconnecting the hydrogen generation in the sectors, knowing he was already doomed. By the time Lelichenko finished his work, his condition was dire. His entire body was red and covered in burns, accompanied by nausea and weakness. Doctors administered saline drips to replenish his bodily fluids. Yet two days later, Lelichenko returned to the power plant. The situation was still critical, with fires breaking out in new locations. Thus, the electrical engineer continued working. He literally had to step over chunks of graphite and stand in radioactive water while turning valves. Four days after the accident, Lelichenko was evacuated to Kiev unconscious. He lived in the hospital for another week and died from radiation sickness. He became the third person killed by the accident at the fourth power reactor. Hisashi Ouchi lived much longer, but he likely didn't take much comfort in that. On the 29th day after the radiation exposure, the muscles of his hand most affected during the accident began disintegrating, creating a risk of kidney blockage. His eyes started bleeding, and all of his nails fell off. Numerous attempts at skin grafts were unsuccessful. Bleeding from the lower intestines and the stomach resumed. The medical staff began to question the feasibility of keeping alive a person who was essentially falling apart. On the 59th day after the accident, Hisashi's heart failed for the first time. In essence, only the machinery was keeping him in this world. Thus, after the subsequent cardiac arrest, they did not attempt resuscitation. 83 days after the accident, Hisashi Ouchi died from radiation exposure. His story, however harrowing, became a true medical marvel. However, for an average person to get such radiation exposure, it would take quite an unfortunate set of circumstances. The greatest risk of radiation exposure in everyday life is in hospitals. X-raying is the most radiologically dangerous procedure if done too frequently. However, to be as exposed as Hisashi was, you'd need to undergo 420 fluoroscopies simultaneously. In second place is food. By consuming one banana, you receive about one-tenth of a microsievert. So to be irradiated like Hisashi, you would have to eat five million bananas. But the greatest radiation danger is in the sky. First, you'll be exposed to the scanner at the airport, but that's nothing compared to the radiation you'll receive once you're above the clouds in an airplane. Still. 
to contract radiation sickness, you'd have to fly continuously without any breaks for your entire life. At least, that is, unless you professionally skydive from altitudes greater than 800 meters. There, you can indeed get irradiated. So, which of the irradiated heroes in this video do you sympathize with the most? Let me know in the comments.